Uh, sorry, hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for allowing Ben and I to perform this triple threat of puns, share, and time code for you this morning. Um, I know this is a really granular topic, but there's actually a lot to cover. So I'm just going to dive right in and talk about what time code is, why I think it's important. And uh, I'll touch briefly upon some problems there are in trying to capture a true legacy uh, waveform time code signal, or signals, plural, and uh, something many of us are not actually able to do given the limitations in the tools that we have. Then Ben is going to, going to pick it up with a more deep tech discussion about these limitations and recent advances that may help us solve them. First of all, why share, right? Well, why not? The pun fits. And, uh, but if you really think about it, share and time code have a few things in common. One, they've both been around forever. And two, <laughs> their relevance is constantly questioned. Uh, should share be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Should discontinuous time code be supported by pres preservation container formats? Hmm, it's the perfect analogy, really. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Michael Angeletti, a video preservationist at Stanford, recently exchanged emails with us regarding case studies he's come across where preserving time code proved to be a worthwhile effort, such as, when an such as when an archive, a collection comes in and it has support documentation, such as edit decision list. Uh, however, he, like many, is capturing time code on a case-by-case -case basis. He wrote, if capturing time code were possible and not super hard to do in every instance, I probably would. I think the reason it isn't always captured is more of a fact that it's a huge pain in the ass with our available tools. And the sentiment is one that I obviously share and the impetus for exploring this question of time code capture. It might not be the most important part of an analog signal, and um, maybe not even as important as some other kinds of ancillary data like closed captioning, but it can be useful to researchers in specific scenarios. Um, but why do we have to guess what those scenarios might be? And uh, why do preservation standards for time codes seem so underdeveloped compared to standards for preserving video and audio and other kinds of ancillary data? So here are some of the problems with capturing time code that we've come across, that we've observed, actually. And most preservation container formats have not been developed to contain the totality of ancillary data from an analog signal. The Library of Congress AS07 Working Group is progressing on specifications for the MXF container format to contain multiple streams of time code, but we still do not have the accessible tools to help us meet those, ex those specifications. Uh, proprietary capture software, at least the ones that we have worked with, such as Blackmagic Media Express and Adobe Premiere, often do not capture timecode in a stream that pre preserves a signal's native discontinuity. Rather, they only capture the timecode of the first frame, or either just they lay down, they, they will capture the timecode of the first frame and then lay down this bogus track right after it, a continuous track, or they'll just stamp the first code into the container's metadata. Uh, and finally, archivists just lack community-supported resources for analyzing, contextualizing, and capturing time code and all of its discontents. Uh, most of the research for this presentation was done by rifling through old pro video magazines from the 1980s. So there are some of the problems that we have uh, encountered in time code adventures, but maybe you're wondering what time code even is. So uh, we assume many of you are probably aware of the basics of time code. So I'll be brief with a little help from an old equipment catalog. Simply put, SMPTE time code is an industry standard frame numbering system that assigns a specific number to each frame of video in hours, minutes, seconds, and frames format. And this assigned frame number can travel with the recorded content and it is copied, edited, and ideally when it is reformatted. It helps keep the, signals, the signal components in sync during these transformations so that the source material can always correspond with edited versions. So in reference to Derek's talk yesterday, it is not equivalent to a trash fire timestamp. Um, it is usually, but not always, an indicator, or uh, not an indicator of real time the work was created. Although we were jo joking around afterwards that time code might be the original trash file fire. Okay, so just a little bit about the history of time code. When analog tape was rolled out in 1956, it was apparent from the start that editors would have to rethink the old cut and splice method used for film. Electronic splicing uh, systems were introduced, but they were tedious and imprecise. 
1967, the Electronic Engineering Company of California introduced a time code synchronization system to the market. And in 1969, SMPTE-EBU standardized the time code that we know today. So each frame of video now has its own unique time code in the 24-hour format, and linear tape-to-tape -tape editing is efficient AF. So time code then became an integral part of production workflows in both film and video environments. On the left side, there are some screen grabs of what is, is, a, is called edit decision list, or EDL. Documents such as EDL are often included with media collections that are acquired by my archive at New York University. When these time codes are actually in a digital copy that researchers can access, the research value of these documents raises. Uh, so I thought it would also be useful to point out that timecode is also part of some film production workflows as film rushes were transferred to video, edited on tape, where TC was then matched with film key codes for final film processing. Um, another instance where timecode serves as metadata, uh, professional production workflows often log the real number of a tape shot in that day's work. So tape one starts at the hour mark, tape two starts at the two hour mark, and so on. There are three characteristics you kind of want to look for when assessing your time code. Number one, is it FITC or LTC? Two, is it drop frame or non-drop frame? Very much an NTSC thing. Um, is it continuous or discontinuous? And in case you were wondering, and maybe you were, DB time, uh, DB time code captured via FireWire, DAT, and non sip time codes are not really included in this discussion. It's a whole other thing for next year, maybe. <laughs> Um, so here are some notes on the differences between LTC and BITC timecode. We have tons of readings on the difference at a pulse level. If you are interested, I'm happy to share those with you, but I'm going to skip over that quite a bit for our purposes. Uh, please note that the lack of track configurations in those images are, um, those track configurations are just, just there in general. They're not specific to any format. Uh, so first is LTC. It is an earlier of the two timecode types. Um, it is often, but not always, as we will learn, recorded on audio track two. It is prone to sync drift, read errors, and cannot be read at fast speeds. It sounds like uh, tapping or static if you listen to it on the audio. Um, there is a link here to a YouTube video, but we'll skip that for now. Um, now, vertical interval time code, or VITC, is integrated into the video track of the tape, which resolves a number of problems found in LTC. It provides indexing revolution down to the video field. Uh, this means VITC time code can be read at speeds uh, the video is played back, all speeds, unlike LTC. Its introduction also freed up the second audio channel for recording. So drop frame and non-drop frame are distinguished by a colon or semicolon present before the frame count. Simply put, they are two different ways of labeling a frame. Drop frame accommodates the 29.97 FPS frame rate of color video in NTSC, introduced after 30 FPS was already established for monochrome. Uh, there's a lot of literature out, out there about how the differences between these two time code labeling schemas occurred, but for our purposes, I think Sean Amaro summarizes it best. Um, when American TV frame rate video production must be edited to actual clock time, non-drop frame time code must be used. If staying in time with an actual clock is not important, especially on short video productions like commercials, the bastard 29.97 FPS um, is often used. So a little bit about continuous versus discontinuous time code, the latter of which we have up until recently, as Ben will tell you, have been unable to really capture. A continuous time code is an unbroken clock moving forward from the first frame to the last. Discontinuous time code occurs when a recording abruptly stops and starts again. Discontinuous time code is common in recordings not made with strict broadcast workflows, video art, independent media, home movies, etc. So that, before I hand this off to Ben, I just want to summarize the research and reconstruction benefits of time code, what it can tell us as metadata, and how it can be used as a tool for discovery. Time code can aid the process of restoring, finishing, or rebuilding a video or film work, even based on existing edit decision, uh, either paper-based or software-generated. And these often come with collections of elements and unfinished work. Time code can identify the placement of a camera roll in an array of tapes. It can contextualize the support documentation found in a collection. 
edit decision lists, filmmakers' journals, notes found in donors' papers. These little scribbles of time code suddenly have more research value if that corresponding time code and access point can be found in a digital file. Similarly, a production documentation that comes in with a video collection often notate interesting or important uh, material recorded on the tapes by their time code ins and out points. Uh, a two-hour camera roll of an uneventful street scene uh, might have a sudden car accident occur at 010236, and that, that's written on the box. To me, that is useful metadata to correspond to a time code track on a digital file. So, <laughs> So now I have sufficiently blown your minds about the relevance of time code. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton to the ever brilliant and delightful Ben Turkus. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you, Kelly. So while getting ready for this presentation, a coworker asked me some version of, do you really care about time code? And I'll tell him what I told you. No, absolutely not. <laughs> But all jo bad jokes aside, I do care about time code as I think we should all care about time code. That said, I think we need to approach this sort of complicated technical problem with an awareness that we do only have limited time and resources on our hands. I think I care most about time code because it's one of those areas within video preservation in which I used to feel, especially when I was starting out, but much later, that everyone else had it all figured out and I was a total idiot. Now, I didn't have time to do the kinds of deep research and outreach that I wish I had in getting ready for today, but my general sense is that the problem of time code has not really been solved in any sort of comprehensive way by the archival community. Or, if I'm incorrect and some groups really have figured it all out, I know for sure that they haven't done so with equity in mind. And what I mean by this is that the ability to retain time code, the ability to create the most authentic of digital surrogates, uh, shouldn't require such a high barrier to entry, requiring specialized, proprietary, or expensive software and hardware. From my perspective, anyone with a deck digged out of a dumpster, a couple cables, a computer, and a decent quality capture card should be able to make this happen. So yes, I care about all of this in as much as I want us all to be able to realize this potential. I'm grateful for all that the Library of Congress, AMWA, the ASO7 group have done to advance our approach to storing complex time code arrangements. In their work with MXF, they've really gotten the ball rolling and they brought great awareness to this subject. And I'm so glad to finally have Ayasa TCO6, thank you Lars, uh, as a new go-to reference for all things video preservation related. But for me, when it comes to time code specifically, I guess what I've always dreamed of having is just some dumbed down practical advice. Like you've got this format, it could have these kinds of time code recorded onto it, um, and you need this kind of deck, these kinds of connections, and this kind of capture card in order to save it properly. There's an abstractness to the information that's out there that I both understand the need for, yet also find deeply frustrating. And unfortunately, as I say this, I'm completely aware that the work and testing that I'm about to describe is partial at best. One of my personal heroes, Carl Fleischhauer, formerly of the Library of Congress, encapsulated so many of the time code complications in this amazing EMEA L listserv post from 2014. What are the issues regarding time code, he wrote. Source recordings may have multiple time codes, VITC and LTC and more. Some are present on purpose, others by accident. Some may have good integrity and continuity, others may dis be discontinuous. Any or all may provide forensic help for future researchers. In the same thread, a little bit later, David Crossweight of DC Video nailed some of the even more ridiculous but not uncommon time code scenarios that you might encounter. There are a lot of bad combos and pitfalls, he wrote. LTC does not match VITC. LTC is drop frame and VITC is non-drop frame. LTC is inconsistent or garbled. The user bit codes, if present, are inconsistent. The VITC changes line assignment or drops out completely in a single tape and the time code in the picture, BITC, does not match either the LTC or the VITC. Building on both of their thoughts, I would say that the problem of time code is really two-sided. There are the challenges of transmitting through a digitization setup the different types of time code, messy or not, that could be recorded on a tape, and there's the work in progress discussion of how best to store these different types of time code within a digital video file. It might even be helpful to break this down even further into four distinct realms. So I'll do my best to tackle some part of all of these over the next few minutes, but what I'm gonna do is walk you through some recent developments in FFmpeg and vRecord, and what I understand to be the in-progress way that Matroska will do with all of this. 
which would be by creating a new structure that would provide a way <laughs> to store all kinds of arbitrary side data at the frame level. Now, this could include time code, perhaps even multiple time codes, but all kinds of other things too, closed captioning information, miscellaneous metadata, and even some stuff that wasn't in the original video signal. Dave recently mentioned to me using this structure to store signal stats or QC tool style information, which could serve a very cool quality control purpose. Now, for those of you who weren't at the conference last year in Vienna, my colleague Genevieve and I spoke about our work at NYPL, specifically how we transitioned from uncompressed QuickTime to uh, lossless FFE1 MKV. Now, how we did this is a rather long and drawn out story, but basically we decided to make the leap and for in-house digitization, we bought a bunch of these Blackmagic Decklink Duo cards, immediately discovered that they weren't gonna work with the current version of ViewRecord, and we used that opportunity to get some money to sponsor ViewRecord development. Now, what happened next was mostly great timing, a little bit of coincidence, but in the months that it took to negotiate and get a contract signed, FFmpeg's Decklink came on board. We swapped that out for BMD tools and ViewRecord, and miraculously, that switch kind of eliminated the Decklink 2 issue. So slightly freed up, this allowed us to focus more on ViewRecord new development than on troubleshooting. And once again, the timing worked out for us. A number of people in FFmpeg were working on timecode-related Decklink patches, and Dave was able to leverage that work and incorporate it into ViewRecord. Now, how all of these things function on a deep technical level is a little bit beyond me, but what I can say that is now, within FFmpeg and ViewRecord, we can one, store a correct first-frame timecode stamp within our files, and two, store ViewRecord-produced sidecar TXTs that will log all of the analog timecode values, continuous or not, as we wait for this larger Matroska side data advance. So let me show you what this actually looks like in ViewRecord, demonstrating with this unbelievably cheesy share music video beta cam tape that I spent an embarrassing amount of money on to get an eBay seller to rush me delivery so that I could test before this presentation. And while you might be cursing me for inundating you with even more share, this actually turned out to be the most incredible test tape because it presented all of these time code issues that I only uncovered through extensive testing and troubleshooting. So when you open ViewRecord now, the configuration menu will give you a few different timecode options. And for the most part, I've been testing and found success with RP188 LTC and straight Vitsi. Though, as I will describe, I've had to kind of bop around from one deck capture card combo to another to figure out the most workable options. And before I get into the timecode specifics of this tape, it might be a decent time to look at my work in progress chart of timecode possibilities by format and say that the work that I'm describing in vRecord more or less privileges SDI. So for older formats that require timecode to be transmitted over a serial or RS-422 connection, while this should be possible, it doesn't really seem to be quite working at the moment. Uh, it can be surprisingly difficult to figure out exactly what the timecode possibilities are for various video formats. One, because there are so many goddamn formats out there, and two, because things vary by deck, and especially with some of the longer-lived formats that evolved timecode capabilities over time, these things were never static in nature. So this chart, which is very arbitrary and just a list of personal favorites slash formats that I work with all the time, uh, you can see some that never offered SMPTE-style timecode altogether, half-inch open reel or EIAJ, uh, to old Betamax, to consumer, uh, Video 8 or Hi8, Sony went its own strange direction with its uh, rewritable consumer timecode, and some that gained capabilities over time. So for Umatic, it started with no timecode, but that in late generation professional decks, it gained the capability to record an LTC track if you had special timecode generator or reader cards, or if you had some weird kind of aftermarket modifications done. And it would write these either as a separate address track underneath the video tracks, so not erasable, or as an audio track typically channeled to. As it's relatively simpler and geared toward the recent FFmpeg work, I've been focused on the Betacam family, specifically played back in SDI-capable decks. But this does lead me to two general pieces of advice. One, you have to know what you're working with format-wise, and you can, too, in many circumstances, trust the deck to tell you what exactly is going on vis-a-vis timecode through its front or control panel light-ups. So when I popped this share tape in various machines, I could see pretty much immediately that it had two types of timecode, LTC and VITC. Now here comes the weird part. What I found in my testing, which again, I urge you not to form any hard and fast opinions about, is that with one deck capture card combo, I was able to capture the LTC, and with another, I was able to capture the VITC, but I was not able to do vice versa. 
Now, this could have been the decks, the cards, or something else that I was missing entirely. But the long and short of it is, even in the simpler case of Betacam, this is way more complicated than I originally thought it would be. Essentially, there are a lot of permutations out there, and we, the vRecord community, would welcome any other testers to confirm or disprove our findings. As I said, this tape was really great because as I went to review the different captures, I discovered that it hit one of those David Crossweight boxes. It has a continuous LTC track that runs throughout and a discontinuous Vitsi track that starts at 59 minutes and 30 seconds with the Chris Isaac video, runs throughout that Chris Isaac video, then jumps back to 59 minutes and 30 seconds before the start of the share video. Now in truth, the Eureka moment is really more of a, oh wait, I don't think I'm doing this right. There's something wrong with these numbers. And as much as I knew that discontinuity was a possibility, um, it just didn't register to me at the time, in part because it's not my habit to sit there watching the time code clock on the deck as I transfer a tape. So here you can see roughly the same moment um, with different time code stamps in vRecord's pass-through mode. And then you can see kind of what this looks like represented in the sidecar TXTs. So even though the solution is imperfect, I think we've made great strides and I'm so appreciative of all of the efforts that have been made. And what amazes me more than getting the ability to save time code, whether valuable or not, and I think we would all agree that in this case, not, is how this digital tool has allowed me to understand analog tapes in a better way. And there's an interesting corollary here with QC tools, which honestly has taught me more about video than any book ever did. FFmpeg, QC tools, V-Record, Media Info, these things can reveal aspects of the analog world that may be hidden or obscured by things like our choices of playback machine. They allow us to work our knowledge backwards from the digital to the analog and gain insight in the process. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and offer just a short list of some technical and workflow items that I think we all should keep discussing as a group. The MKV side data for time code and other things. Uh, Decklink needs to gain the ability to read multiple time codes. Uh, format by format decision tree with recommendations for different scenarios. Uh, rethinking our workflows and setups. Uh, automated conversion of LTC audio tracks. Uh, user bits, which are very cool but not discussed at all in this conversation. And more general vRecord testing and tweaking. Thank you all very much. Hi, Pat Orridge. Um, surely for, from a conservation point of view, it's better to take the um, approach of capturing everything as it is and then looking at tools for extracting it and manipulating that later on. My, my worry is that if you make the wrong choice during the capture process and you miss important time code, you haven't got it later on. Um, we should really be looking at taking all that vertical inter interval inter information, storing it in our encoded files, mm. as long, along with LTC timecode, even if it's as analog, and then looking at development tools later on that can extract from that whatever we need. And your view on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's essentially what we're, we've been trying to, to do. Um, LTC audio, I'd always recommend just capturing as an audio track, as I mentioned in the um, slide. And then as far as uh, different tracks, uh, right now, the container formats, we're not capable of actually storing them. So even though the conservation ethics would teach us capture everything, that's not actually physically possible at this point. So the work that we've been describing is trying to solve some of those problems. Um, but yes, ideally, save it all um, and then figure it out later. Um, another question from online? Is it, um, no, actually, I think you already answered that, but is it possible to, when you have the two time codes, um, like the Vitsi time code is part of the image on the upper rows, mm -hmm. and is it po like, can you use V-Record to capture those upper lines graphically? As far as I know, it's capturing everything that's in the video signal. Though, again, it probably depends on your choice of capture card, I think. Yeah, because those are sometimes like outside mm -hmm. of the part that they, OK. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. OK, I think uh, we probably, do you have one question? Okay. It's just, is there an open source SMT LTC decoder? Dolby has one. I, I saw something on GitHub. Um, so if you Google GitHub LTC uh, SMPTE, I think you'll find it. I don't remember the name. I'm sorry, I didn't put it in. I haven't tested it, though, so I don't actually know if it works. Mm -hmm. 
And there's another tool that's mentioned in the IASA TC06 um, that, again, I forgot the name of, LTC AUX, I think. Um, Would you provide a C-Sensor for Yeah, absolutely. Great. 